All right, everybody, welcome to the Bandwidth Kaleidoscope Ears podcast from the blustery and cold climes of Southern California. And as always, it's a pleasure to uh, have my favorite enemy of the state, my co-host, uh, James Corbett, with me. Hi, James. Hey, but I don't think you can say cold climes of Southern California. No one's going to believe that. <laughs> no one's going to believe it, and it's been freezing here. It's so cold, it's nonstop wind. In April? You look... It's, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's been going on. Like, you look outside and the palm trees are like, their their fronds are, are, you know, 90 degree angle as you look out the window. And it's been like that for weeks on end. It gets cold here. When the clouds come in, you got the ocean right here. The clouds come in and the wind kicks in. It's pretty nasty. And by the way, I have to, this has nothing to do with Beatles, but I have to mention this now because I forgot to mention to you when we were talking earlier, there was a tornado, right? In California? In Montebello, California, which is a suburb of L.A. That I ran into a student, and I told him about this Montebello tornado. He goes, he goes, yeah, I heard about that, but there was one right here in Venice. There was one right here in Venice by the beach, and he showed me photos of, like, the roof blown off of this building and power lines went down and all this, and... I had lost power that day in, in my building, wow. in my neighborhood. We lost power. So, uh, wow. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Crazy, crazy. But uh, I've seen this. Well, it's not not for this extended period, but I've seen weather like this before in L.A., just not constant, constant. And to this day, it's crappy out. Yesterday, I went to busk. I remember Matt, uh, my sax player, sent me a text and he goes, you know what, man? I was outside. And he goes, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna join you today. Wow. And I said, well, have a good rest. I went out there. His instincts are always right, man. It was like, it was cold. Uh, and people were looking at me like people that knew me were like, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, well, and is that is your California weather update from Vinny and James. See you next month, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Climate emergency. Oh! <laughs> All right, so I'll Get You is the Beatles song we're covering. And uh, this is one of those song titles that the early days of the Beatles, there were some song titles that if you just say it, the song title to me, it takes me a minute to think, what song is that? Mm. Right? Yeah. And I think in this case, it's because the hook doesn't bop you over the head. Like, she loves you, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, right, she right. Lo All right, that's called She Loves You. Yeah. But this is one of those cases where the title is embedded. It's not like a separate chorus. Like, I'll get you, I'll get you, I'll get you, da, 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 you know. Um, so that's part of the reason, I guess, that uh, some of these songs, uh, early songs at least, I, I don't remember what song it is when the title is uh, sent to me. Anyway, okay, this is a two minute and six second song. Unbelievable. And they carried this tradition of really short songs that give you so much of a bang for your buck, even until Revolver. And I'm thinking that it might have been the Beatles that were the first to break the rules. And, you know, a song like Hey Jude that goes on for, what, six, seven minutes, right? Uh, I Am the Walrus goes on. Um, I think they might have been the first pop group to, to break the rules of how long a song should be. And I think I mentioned to you, James, I, I, I've been thinking I want, one of these days I want to do a podcast of like Beatles first, like the first band ever, right? Because there's so many, so many things the Beatles did first. All right, so I'll get you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? That's Buddy Holly right off the bat. But, you know, I was doing some research and uh, the Beatles Bible and somebody commented, this song is very Roy Orbison. And I thought, bingo, this song is very Roy or Orbison. Many, many, many ah, times. Right. It's, okay. it's got this kind of like, there was a style, especially in yeah. the girl bands, this kind of histrionic, melodramatic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah oh. Yeah. It's 50s. Roy Orbison. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. 50s, right. 50s, melodramatic. Yeah. Especially the girl bands did that a lot. I mean, uh, there were songs about, like, 
you know, the boyfriend dying in a motorcycle crash, things like this, you know. Um, so, yeah. Um, so first, uh, James, maybe did you do any uh, kind of looking at the historical context? Yeah, there isn't a lot. Um, so a lot. Yeah. let's look at yeah. Revolution in the Head. Ian McDonald has a short write-up, um, apparently recorded on the 1st of July, 1963, uh, UK released 23rd of August, US released 16th of September. It was the B-side of She Loves You. Uh, it was squeezed in at the end of the She, Love you ses she Loves You session, Get You in the End, as it was then called, was tossed off in confidently casual style. Only the uncorrected vocal fluffs at 56 seconds, 114, and 116, for those of you keeping track at home, uh, proved that what little time was left at the end had to be devoted to Lennon's harmonica overdub. One of the group's most delightful throwaways... I'll Get You works its audience so brazenly that it's hard not to laugh at its cheek. Playing up their Liverpool accents for all they're worth, Lennon and McCartney drawl their way through a mock-naive love lyric framed by sardon sardonic oh yeahs, echoing the refrain of the track's A-side, She Loves You. Uh, to judge by its melodramatic directness and the climactic seventh in its bridge, I'll Get You was written in late 1962, 50-50 by McCartney, who probably started it, and Lennon, who may have provided the chorus and the jeering middle eight with its earthy three-part harmony. To be a true Beatles fan during the early 60s entailed a fanatical devotion to the group's B-sides, and with its plumply rounded bass sound and air of dry self-send-up, I'll Get You is one of the best. Huh. I don't think as highly uh, of a song <laughs> as he does, but... Uh... It is a kind of a throwaway song. Yeah. Wouldn't you say? I mean, yeah, it, it's, it's a bit the... It's not yeah. one that's going to make their fame and fortune. Now, what what did he say the, the original title was? Uh, uh, get, get You, get in, get the you end. in the End. Get You in the End. Okay, yeah. Little comment about that. I think I mentioned before I, I was on a Beatles forum and I started this thread called Beatles Sexual Innuendos, mm, which was yeah. really popular. <laughs> yeah. And I always thought, like... This reminds me of, like, my mom used to go around the house singing, like, songs from the 40s. And I always thought, like, was the reason for the baby boom all... Oh, hey there. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't go there right now. Okay. <laughs> uh, the, uh, <laughs> the, the musical, uh, uh, lyrical... The lyrical uh, <laughs> content <laughs> inspired people. <laughs> to get them in the end yeah no yes, I <laughs> yes. I must admit as I was listening I'm like they didn't mean that double entendre did they but maybe they did <laughs> but if you it was called Beatles, get you in the end did. this would be more memorable you would remember because that's yeah, more like yeah. what the hook is right I remember my mom used to sing this song from the 40s pop song called uh, if somebody loves you it's no good unless they love you all the way through the good and lean years, and all the way. And, and, and like, you know, I'm hearing all these songs, and they, they seem to have these, like, Freudian innuendos. And I'm thinking, is this the reason for the baby boom? Like, the <laughs> ones, like songs that were in flight, you know. And even back in the 40s, they had the kind of same uh, love song theme that the teen songs of the 60s had, which is like, oh, they said we're too young. Mm. They called it puppy love. Mm. Well, there was there were songs from the 40s that were like that, that said they were too young to be getting together, but we know better because we're deeply in love type of thing. Well, given the lack of uh, babies here in Japan, maybe we need a revival of that rather than K-pop or whatever the kids are listening to. You guys are experiencing a lack of babies? Is that right? I think that's worldwide. I yeah. Think, uh, America it's particularly yeah. bad here, but yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, um, come on, Japan. Go at it, baby. Get them in the end. All right. Or wait, no. Yeah, uh, get them in the end. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> and when work. I touch you, I feel happy inside. Give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, while we're on the subject of the lyrics, you know, this is one thing I brought up shortly in another podcast, but... Um, easy, because I know I've imagined I'm in love with many, many, many times before. Right? This was like, they were trying to sound like the black artists, and there was a bit of what they call cultural appropriation these days uh, in, in that. Uh, you can be sure it was respectful. So 
again, you hear like I was thinking about this, like you you listen to the teen girl bands of the early 60s and then you listen to like the Motown pop and then you listen to uh, uh, like Roy Orbison or whatever or the leftover straggling 50s doo-wop groups this is the early 60s the Beatles you know, they managed, they, they, they were so influenced by all of these sounds that they kind of clumped them into one gumbo, you know, back in these early days. So uh, you can hear a lot of influence. And one thing they wouldn't let go of, first of all, all right, let me, there's a lot of play on the major seven chord in this song. Oh. that very early on as a kid that these major seven sounds I didn't know the name for them but it sounded very loungy and ballady to me we can also the cool thing about this is that we find that major seven effect not only there but in the bridge well this go up. wow I wish I could sing go 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 Right, so you get that major seven sound in there too. Again, it contributes to a very loungy, quasi jazz ballad effect. So th there you have that lounge effect, right? Then you have this kind of Roy Orbison, kind of melodramatic young love thing. You have the Buddy Holly influence. Oh yeah, oh yeah. But then, the thing is, and I'm sure they were a little bit self-conscious whenever they did ballads. You remember what Paul said about yesterday. It's like, oh, well, you know, we were a dance hall band, you know, rock and roll. So when you hear a song, it's really funny to listen to the, the uh, isolated guitar parts because they have to make sure it's rock and roll, even though the song is kind of ballady. So it's like... <laughs> And I was waiting, the next, uh, all right, to go through the chorus for the verse is a D, G, A. So it's one, four, five. Then it does the 50 style, one, six, four, five. Right? So when they're doing... I'm wondering, what are they going to do in the B minor? You can't do that on the B minor. It would sound really bad. So what what is in the guitar is this. So they left out that little flourish. Because you notice it was a bad note. It was out of key note on the B minor. That's a G sharp. We're in the key of D. There's no G sharp in the key of D. So the only way you could do something like that was to be would be to play a G, which is keeps it in the key, but it's not like rock and roll. I, uh, you know, my band, the Blue Kind, I had written this song. Uh, and then it has a release. Uh, Right? Mike was originally on playing uh, the rhythm guitar, the other guitarist, he was playing. But I'm going to a minor key, and that needed a D note, so I was told to play. Uh, which works in yeah. the context. Yeah, uh, it, it sounds all right in that context, but in this song, I don't think it would work. No, no, of course not. And nobody would have thought of that in any case, you know. Uh, 
So basically, yeah, the song is a one four five one six four five. All right, let me let me just run through the chord changes. So that's the verse. <laughs> So that goes back to the one, six, four, five, right? The A minor, of course, it, it stands out, doesn't it? Right? Yeah. Except it's not used typically, okay? And I did a little bit of research on this, and I was fascinated by this fact. Paul said he nicked that from a Joan Baez record. Joan Baez was a peer, a folk singer, who was a peer of Bob Dylan's. And I'm thinking, like, were they aware of Bob Dylan this early on? It's, it's just like, I don't know what the deal was uh, regarding that. It, I know that Bob Dylan was a thing, you know, in those early days of the Beatles. He was happening here in the States, you know, so, but obviously they weren't yet influenced by him or were impressed by him even. So can you explain where that comes from? It's a five minor? Yeah, five minor, that's one way to look at it. But, you know, this is the kind of thing that, uh, all right, uh, I'm thinking of, uh, what am I thinking of? <laughs> So when we go to the bridge, right, we're at E. That's the five minor. But it's doing the proper thing it's supposed to do, which act as a two five, right? B minor, see, all right, we're momentarily, it's not a, a dedicated modulation by any means, but we're momentarily going to the key of A, and the second chord of the key of A is B minor. And the fifth chord of the key of A is uh, E, which is a 2-5 going to A as the 1. Mind you, the song is an E, so we're going to A there, right? Now, they did this a number of times, and Paul admits it, like it was their new trick, and they talk about that. But this is the, I, this may be the, f I don't know, I'm not going to say it's the first time they did it, but this is not being used as a 2-5. It's just a color chord, Okay. So this is uh, kind of like you were discussing a song of yours earlier on that, that you asked me what that chord was, and it comes from another mode altogether. Okay, so in this case, we're rooted in the key of D major. And you know, James, how much I don't like this concept of key, the way it's typically used, right? Um, but I, I, you know, just for the sake of most people are programmed this way, so I'll talk in that manner. But A minor, where is a where is a key where there's a D chord and an A minor chord? You know, can you uh, compute oh, uh, that? Oh, G. Good. Yeah. Excellent. Very good, man. Right. So, but if we're rooted on D, and the chords come from G, when you root on this D chord, the fifth step of the key of G. What mode is that? Uh, mixolydian. Mixolydian, good, right. You really got a handle on all this stuff now. It's great. I learned from the best, Vinny. <laughs> <laughs> so all this is really providing is a color change. It's not really doing... It's probably... It, it didn't do that like a 2-5-1, no, right? No, right. So, so it's really, it's just a color chord. Yeah, it would have been, actually, the A chord would have been horrifying. Yeah. You know? Why? Isn't that odd? My friend. You know? Yeah. Weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's, that A minor is... Um, it's it's a cool color. Um, it's deceptive to my ear in the sense that I would I would expect it to have gone to the G chord, 
right? Which would have kept it in the Mixolydian category anyway, but uh, yeah. And I think that, you know, it's funny, there was this big discussion because, you know, uh, who's the name, McDonald's, uh, the revolution of the head Ian guy. McDonald, yeah. Ian McDonald. Um, there was that quote on the Beatles, Beatles Bible, and a lot of people started arguing that, no, no, this wasn't equal parts John and Paul. This was mostly a John song. And that's what I would say. I would say this is mostly John. Somebody said, you know, probably Paul just contributed the A minor chord, and that was just about it because Paul liked it so much. And then someone said, oh, I'm glad to know you were there. Please tell us more about what happened when they were this song. <laughs> <laughs> But the other was Ian McDonald, so there you go. Uh, in fact, I think, uh, I don't know if you caught it, I thought there was a Lennon quote that he talked about this was mostly him. I didn't see that, but uh, yeah. I, it does sound Johnny to me. It does not sound Polly. Yeah. Oh, by the way, you know, I had to watch it just out of curiosity. Paul does a cover, did, did a cover of this in his solo career. Uh Pretty relatively recently in the past 10 years or so, I think. How do you do? And it's actually pretty nice. It's okay. nice. It's really good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't like to see hear the three-part harmony done with other people, mm -hmm. but still. You know. Oh, okay. Well, when we get into the harmonies, I have something to say about that. Okay. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, let's stay on the melody of... We'll talk about the harmonies in a moment. Uh, but I just want to talk about, um, go through the rest of the chords here. This is something I like in the melody. So we're going into the bridge. It's gonna be a and there's your major seven. Gonna be a time that you're gonna change your mind. So you might as well resign yourself to me. That is... Right there in the Nashville tradition of good melody writing, good good chord writing, good. What I love about this is the melody repeats every time, but there's a different color behind the melody each time. And then we have to go to the five chord, so you have to tie up the melody. Da, 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 oh yeah, which I always thought that last time, yeah, was really funny. All right, so I just wanted to mention that. Now we could talk about the harmonies. And um, there's a certain, like, I didn't have the patience to tease out the different parts in the harmonies. So I went to, we haven't mentioned this name in quite some time, but our favorite Italian uh, Beatles vocal aficionado, Gagliazzo Frudua. And I'll leave a link to uh, what we're about to play here. But James, um, if you could, I'd like to first before we get into it, I just want to mention there's a kind. Of, I've mentioned that there's a certain awkwardness to the melodies. Once you hear this broken down, you'll notice it. It's uh, it. All right, this is what I think happened. If they were working nose to nose, I think there was a lot of twisting and turning with the melody, trying to get it to work, and. Um, You'll notice there are certain parts where John sings very low. And um, there's also like a weird, like it doesn't seem like a natural, like something you sing out melody, like just naturally. Uh, uh, let me see. Uh. It's not likely to pretend. It's not likely. Yeah, the, you'll hear on the, um, when we do this, when we sort out the different parts. Uh, I want you to uh, keep an ear to... Um, where was it? Listen to the It's Not Likely to Pretend on the John melody. So if you could cue up and play um, the John melody line from our good friend... Galeazzo. I've imagined I'm in love with you many, many, many times before. It's not like me to pretend. But I to pretend. That's like an awkward melody. 
I like we to 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 pretend. Is that the line? Something like it. But I think the melody, the intention, see, that's the thing, John, and this is something we've discussed, like which is the melody and which is the harmony. I think what's going on here is that the melody and the harmony are jumping from between Paul and John. So it's not likely to pretend that's the real melody, yeah, right? You yeah, can hear yeah, it. Yeah, that's yeah, the yeah, one that's yeah. supposed to be there. So the, the melody, the actual melody flows over to Paul in that moment, which I think is you know, kind of an interesting little point to, to pick up on. Uh, let's keep going with John. Okay. Yes, I will. I'll get you in the end. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, there's gonna be a time. Really low. And it goes even lower. So you might as well resign yourself to me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really reaching yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, that reminds me of i had this girlfriend uh she, i used to crack her up like we we'd hear some pop song and i always had uh oh, 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 oh yeah i just throw that at the end of any pop song we heard just bust her up um <laughs> oh, good days um all right so that like it's kind of weird now why don't we listen to the Paul McCartney part? Maybe we'll pick up on something oddball there, too, as well. I've imagined I'm in love with you Many, many, many times before It's not like me to pretend But I'll get you, I'll get you in the end Yes, I will, I'll get you in the end Fact whole section is the real melody of the song but you know when he sings it's not likely i think was the line there's kind of this oddball little like weird melodic frag i think it's it's not likely um it's not like me to pretend oh it's not like me you know i, I had drummed into my head since i was a kid i always said they, they said likely but yeah it's not like me um so they're you know again they're they're, they're obviously trying to make everything fit together yeah. just right and you definitely right? hear it on pretend yet yeah, clearly paul's got the melody at that point now one thing i thought was when you hear uh galeazzo sing that really low lennon part i'm thinking was this song transposed from another higher key and and you know john just couldn't reach a lot of the notes so they they took it down it could be though that they designed it with the harmony in mind so they it could that, be. They had to do it low, right? Because the real melody is what Paul's singing, but John's not going to sing that. So they kind of yeah, design yeah. the melody lower. Right? But that's the weird thing is that sometimes John sings the real yeah, melody. Right, sometimes yeah, it's like yeah. the underneath harmony. It's, well, it's while very... we're on the subject of Galeazzo Frudua, our favorite Italian Beatles aficionado, I have watched his breakdown of um, uh, the If I Fell harmony, like 18 hundred times <laughs> i don't know why it's just fascinating to for wow, me to yeah, hear the yeah, two separate yeah. parts and then how they come together and it, yeah. there as well it's like which one is the melody and i think yeah. john's singing the harmony here and like the way yeah. they go together it's like it had to be created that way yeah yeah and, and that was a high priority for them because of the doo-wop and the girl groups you know they were singing three-part harmony they loved the sound I mean, it really, truly needs to be understood. And these days, it's so hard to feel and sense what the true context of the times were. But the fact that the Beatles had to tune in for one hour, one day a week to Hamburg radio and try to, you know, get their radio antenna lined up just right so they could hear American music. It's really wild. It kind of reminds me of, I don't know how true this is, but it kind of reminds me of, uh, I read the biography of Bob Marley and this author said, uh, now, uh, you're old enough, James, to remember, like, this, the sound of, like, AM transistor radios, oh, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? Crystal and clear audio <laughs> fidelity. <laughs> <laughs> you can hear, like, a drift, like, almost like a, sh almost like a, a, a phase, uh, like a flanging sound, right? Well, supposedly, according to this book, 
the reason why the reggae sound happened was Jamaicans were listening to American music through their AM radios, and it sounded like their accents were, were reversed, so you'd hear the uh, one, two, three, four, one, two, they, in other words, there's this kind of switch sound, so the, the, it might have been one, two, three, four, but they're just here, one, two, three, four, so supposedly that was the advent of reggae music by mishearing if that's true that's awesome that's yeah. like so cool, cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah all right so now um we'll listen to george's part george only comes in in the release the bridge section so let's let's get a listen to george's it's a great part by the way okay well there's gonna be a time when i'm gone It's great. Now, for the piece de resistance, let's hear the whole song as uh, Galeazzo put it together. I've imagined I'm in love with you many, many, many times before. It's not like me to pretend, but I'll get you, I'll get you in the end. Yes, I will, I'll get you in the end. Okay, so my comment actually, um, and I can't remember where I read this now. Did I? Oh yeah. Okay, so it is in the notes on his video here. He says uh, this is one of the songs where Paul amazingly imitates John's vocals to better merge the two harmonies, and he's exactly right about that because I think yeah, for a long time I couldn't t like when uh, I think it was during the I'll get you, I'll get you in the end. Like I, I couldn't almost differentiate their voices. Like, are they both John? Did he yeah. double track? <laughs> Because, yeah, Paul, it was an amazing vocal mimic. And in this case, I think, yeah, he was trying to sound like John. Yeah, in fact, when Paul does the harmonies, now this is interesting too, and while my guitar gently weeps, when Paul harmonizes vocally with George, he he adapts George's style as well. Yeah, he was, yeah, no, he had so much vocal control. He was truly a great, great vocalist. Only rivaled by Billy Joel. <laughs> So let's get people to argue in the comments section about uh, Day in the Life um, transitioning back to the verse. Who was doing that? <laughs> was it John or Paul? <laughs> and people still argue about that. We're, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not getting the comments. Uh, from we're, the middle we're... eight. Uh, get up, get out of bed. Woke up, get out of bed. Uh, slip uh, into a dream. Uh, 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 that bit. Who was that? Was that John or Paul? People still argue about that. Oh, yeah. I always thought it was John. Hmm. Yeah, I think technically, officially, you are correct. But it, there's a point at which it sounds to me like Paul, and then it sounds to me like John. It's it's weird. I don't know. Anyway. You know, that hap That kind of weird John Paul dyslexia happened to me with um, Kenny Lane. During the transition of in some meanwhile back, there were times I thought it sounded like Paul and times I thought it sounded like John. Yeah. Well, it's even harder when Paul is trying to sound like John, right? <laughs> yes, yeah, because yeah. he's good at it. Yeah. He's good at it. So another thing to notice is the oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, high octave. So... That place is just John and Paul singing in unison octaves, right? And uh, I just want to mention, I might have mentioned this before, the band Squeeze from the 80s um, made a career out of that. They would just sing like a guy would sing a low octave, the other guy would sing the high octave, and they had a number of songs that did so that. So in the three-part harmony at the in the middle eight, what does George sing for that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a cool line because he's just like picking up notes of the triads. Um, I'd have to listen to it again. I, I like I said, I didn't bother with uh, figuring out what was what, but yeah, um, that might be the. Oh, 
is it what? is it there? Yeah. Want to listen to it again? We can listen to it. Yeah, I do suddenly want to. So you might- Yeah, yeah. So uh, that was uh, okay. So basically, what I'm mentioning is just the uh, the uh, kind of oddball quality of some of the melodies in here, and the, the juxtaposition between jo- Paul and John taking over the main melody parts. Um, whatever it is, it's great, you know. And. Uh, only thing else to discuss, I mean, I I don't think there's much to talk about in terms of the bass part and the drums. Everything seems pretty conventional, and it's really early. But, you know, George Martin's idea to put hand claps in there, right? And uh, if you ever listen to the isolated tracks, oh, my God, you click on... Uh, guitar and harmonica, maybe it's the nature of the software, like this guy's software isn't that great, but it sounds horrible, like really horrible. Like, do these guys even know how to play music? But one thing I realized is, I think this might be the only song the Beatles did with harmonica where the harmonica plays nonstop throughout the whole thing, except when this chord comes in. Because the harmonica's in D and it can't play yep. any mi- so an A minor. You can't do that, right? Yeah. So he literally just doesn't play anything in that moment. Then he comes back in, right? <laughs> which helps to emphasize but, that chord in a way. Yeah, which well, yeah, that, that'll that'll emphasize it for sure. So yeah, I'd say, uh, are we under an hour, Jim? Forty minutes. Yeah. Okay. And I think I've run out of things to wow. say about this song. Wow, it's a record. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you want a music theory analysis, the only chord that's, well, there are two chords outside of the key. We discussed the A minor, which is part of the D mixolydian mode. D remains root, and you're allowed to, but because that A minor comes from the key of G, right, uh, you're, you're just, you're basically adding color from this other key, and you're allowed to do that. It's called mixing modes. There's a, a technical term, I forget, I always use the term mixing modes, there's another term for it, modal something or other thing. Whatever. Modal interchange, yeah, that's it, modal interchange. Um, and the other chord is a secondary dominant chord. E7. E7, yeah. <laughs> On the, why this works, on the D chord, you have the F sharp, passing note E, to the D note, which is also in the D chord, right? Then we have F sharp on the G chord, which is the major seven, the major six, to the fifth. Now, this is why the E7 is interesting, because we get the ninth. Oh, sorry. What's going on? So that's it. F sharp is the ninth of the E7, the root of the E7, and the seven of the E7. So that is a that little E7 chord is really great. It really is because it adds a new color that that you didn't expect to happen. And that's just I said like the great classic Nashville songwriters they know about this stuff. Take one melody, change chords through it. Right. That that's a that's a and for people playing track. along at home, it's it's putting it in a different the same melody in a different context. So it's it's different. Uh, what do you call it? Chord functions in each um, right right iteration. Right right. Yeah, that's true. Here you here you can just have a basic D. That E note is just passing, but you can say it's a sus two or whatever. This high note on the G creates another chord called the G major seven, 
If that note wasn't there, we just have to. But this, and then the E7, that's really, really where the rubber hits the road. Nine, yeah. You get that nice ninth up top, and it works so beautifully well. And, uh, all right, now I'm just kind of yeah. wasting time here. Right well, now. anyway, it, yeah. Okay, it works. It's a good throwaway. Yes. And uh, I just want to say something real quick to my audience, all four or five of you. Um, uh, yeah, I, uh, I don't usually, you know, I'm not, I never monetize my channel. I, I don't really care to make money from YouTube. And I never say, don't forget to smash that like button and subscribe. <laughs> I never do that stuff. Maybe because I'm an anti-cliche person in general. But um, if you do like these podcasts and you'd like to contribute, right now I'm going through a very rough patch in my personal life, and a little cashish wouldn't hurt. So if you'd like to contribute to this cause, the Vinny Caggiano Help Me Survive cause, uh, you can go to uh, paypal.me, M as in Mary, forward slash vincognito and you could contribute there whatever you'd like little bits matter or uh my venmo which i will uh put up my uh qr code for you to snapshot while i'm talking and we get our good friend brock to put the image up there and uh James, as always, it's just a lot of fun working with you and discussing these Beatles songs together. I'm having a great time, and yeah. I always do. And uh, not only, of course, if you do appreciate this, please do contribute to Vinny, but also if you want to be like me and be able to identify that uh, it's, oh, D Mixolydian <laughs> in that moment of A minor, <laughs> Vinny is the man you should be going to for lessons. I 100% attest he knows what he's talking about. He can teach all of this to you. So please consider it. Thank you so much. You know what? Um, the majority of like the majority of students I get from the internet that have seen Beatles analysis and stuff like that, um, they're like guys that want to learn the theory. They're interested in understanding yeah, right. you know, yeah. the cool. stuff. So th thanks for mentioning that. Yeah, of course. Like I work for a living. You know, I, I don't live on donations. So if you want to be a student of mine and learn all this esoteric, like highfalutin sounding. Yeah, scholastic. theory geeks of the world unite. Or even if you just want to learn guitar, right? Right, exactly. All right. Awesome. So I guess that'll be it. Everybody have a great week and have a great month and have a great life and we'll see you again. And I'll see you, James, very soon. Take care. Take care.